This is the land diving ceremony from the island of Vanuatu, and that is a tower they built specifically for this ceremony. It's as tall as a 10-story building, and this guy is about to do something crazy. Why is he doing this? Almost every culture in the world has a coming-of-age ceremony, an event that celebrates a child's passage into adulthood, or a, a test of their skills or their bravery or the maturity that proves they've earned the right to be an adult. Some of these just take the form of a fun gathering or a party, while some can just be goddamn brutal. From feats of endurance to starvation to doing awful things to very sensitive body parts. Today I've collected examples of the wildest coming-of-age rituals from around the world and ranked them on a scale from a good time to dear god why? Why? And believe it or not, this guy isn't even in the worst category. Teenage years are crazy, man. Cause, Cause you're still so young, you know, and, and your experience of life is still so narrow and the vast majority of that time you were a kid and you live by kid rules. Some of which sucked, like you didn't have any control over your own life or anything like that. But on the flip side, there were a lot of responsibilities you didn't have to deal with. Maybe you didn't even know about, but now you're like a little adult and, and there's a whole new set of rules and pressures. And you have to prove to the adults in your family and your community that you can handle it. You know, that you're on the same level as them. And they need to know they can trust you if you need to, you know, handle things to be a productive member of society. And this has been true since the beginning of time. For as long as people have squozen smaller versions of themselves from their loins. It's a universal part of growing up in all cultures, all places, all times. So it should be no surprise that this process has been formalized in a lot of different ways. One might argue that that's what the school system does in the industrialized world. Other places have other ideas, but they all serve the same purpose. Coming of age rituals are the way that communities welcome young people into adulthood and give the teenager a chance to prove their worth to the community through a test of skills or courage or the ability to withstand an extreme amount of pain. So this video is gonna serve as sort of a tier list uh, where I'm gonna go down the tiers from a good time down to dear God, why? Why? That's, that's an actual category. I named it that. Okay, now before this comes up in the comments, and I know it will, uh, I just want to say that this is not meant in any way to make fun of other cultures. Um, a lot of these involve indigenous groups, and this is not meant in any way to paint them as backwards or barbaric or anything like that. This is just a fun exploration of the various ways human beings have come to celebrate the blossoming of a child into an adult. Pain. So let's get into our list and we'll start with, you know, the fun stuff. In the United States, Sweet 16 parties are held for girls on their 16th birthday to celebrate the ability to drive and the fact that they're only one year away from being the subject of a winger song. Actually, a lot of rock songs are obsessed with the age 17. Even the Beatles. She was only 17, if you know what I mean. I think it means you're a pervert. Sweet 16 parties can range from just extra fancy birthday parties to huge social events with tiaras and ball gowns. They came from the tradition of debutante balls where the parents of a young girl would present her to society as an adult and suitable to receive suitors. This was also known as a coming out party. Uh, so yeah, out through the Victorian days, it was a big moment when a girl finally came out. So yeah, coming out, but not in the context of like an LGBT person coming out of the closet. Although that, that has been a thing in recent years is to have uh, coming out parties for that, which by the way, if you're having one, uh, let me know, I'll bring cake. Debutante balls can trace their roots to the United Kingdom where the tradition was started by King George III when he threw Queen Charlotte's ball in 1780. In the Southern US, cotillion balls are an extra big version of this. And uh, by the way, they actually, the cotillion was originally like a dance that was done at the debutante balls and then just kind of became its own thing. Of course, a similar version of that in the Hispanic community is the quinceanera, which they do when the girl turns 15. Similar kind of vibes, big dresses, lots of dancing, parents, you know, presenting her for potential suitors. And being from Texas, I can tell you, they go hard. <laughs> they, are, they are not messing around with the quinceaneras. It's, it's, uh, it's a good time. So yeah, it, it belongs in this tier. In Japan, on the second Monday of January, they celebrate coming of age day or Shijinsky, which kind of celebrates everybody who reached legal age in the previous year. Which actually, it kind of went through a major change recently because the legal age in Japan dropped from 20 to 18, but they still celebrated at 20. The girls wear fancy traditional kimonos and the guys put on their best suit and tie and parties are held all over the country. There are similar coming of age ceremonies that go back to like the 700s in Japan, but the current version started after World War II as a way to kind of cheer up the younger generations. So these are all very social celebrations without a lot of 
uh, religious meaning to them or anything like that. Though there are some Catholic traditions that are become involved in some of the quinceañeras. But uh, yeah, when we get into the religious rites, that's when things go up a notch. The first one that might come to mind for a lot of people are the bar and bat mitzvahs in Judaism. Because these are kind of like quinceañeras and sweet sixteens, except they get a lot more mashuga. Bar mitzvahs are celebrated when a boy turns 13, same for girls, but they're called bat mitzvahs. In the ceremony, the boy is called out to read from the Torah and to give a speech, usually in a way that ties the passage that he read into his own life. And then he gets to don traditional accessories called tefillin, which are leather straps that go around your head and your arm. And that ceremony, of course, is meant to display that the young man's ready to take his place amongst the adults of the community, and then he's ready to accept and live by the biblical commandments. But it's all accompanied by a large party, kids get lots of gifts, it's a big deal and a good time. Um, it belongs in the good time category, but it's religious, so I put it here. Young Catholics have a similar ritual with the confirmation ceremony at 13 years old. After studying the Bible in a confirmation class, they perform a ritual that involves picking a confirmation name, uh, which is usually the name of a saint that they want to emulate, and then they get anointed on the forehead with oil. It's meant to kind of complete the process of them being baptized when they were infants, so like, you know, now that they're adults, or adult-ish, they can confirm the baptism into the faith. It's an important moment for a Catholic kid, but uh, it's not quite the throwdown that their Jewish friends get. In Muslim Malaysia, 11-year-old girls participate in the Katam al-Quran, where they're uh, required to memorize the last chapter of the Quran and then recite it publicly in order to show that they have the maturity to be treated as adults. The Hindu Chuta Karana ritual is interesting because it's a, it's a coming of age ritual, but it's done on babies. This isn't meant to signal that the babies are adults. <laughs> it's just meant to show that they've shed all the traces of their previous life because they believe in reincarnation. It's basically a ritual around the baby's first haircut because they believe that a person's past life continues in the growth of their hair. Um, so yeah, they basically shave the baby's head in a ritual so that the baby can start anew with their new life. In another hair-related ceremonies, in China, Confucian boys participate in the Guan Li, where they have their hair twisted and capped with a ceremonial cap called a Guan. This is a very traditional ceremony that goes back to ancient Qin dynasty and it marks the passage from childhood to adulthood. Males do this at 20 years old. Young girls have a similar ceremony at 15 years old called the Zhi Li. Uh, not to be confused with the critically acclaimed Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck movie. Now actually it's named after the Zhi, which is a, a type of hairpin that's used in the ceremony. Last but not least is something that I always actually thought was pretty cool, and that's the Amish Rumspringa. So the Amish are famously um, very devout. They shun modern technology and conveniences. It's a very strict life, but they do give their young'uns a choice. Between the ages of 16 and 20, Amish kids are allowed to kind of try out more worldly experiences before deciding if they want to commit to the Amish way of life. Um, it's kind of like a religious hall pass. The tradition has German roots and Rumspringa roughly translates to jumping or hopping around. And it varies by person and community. You know, for some, it might just be that they get to drive a car for a little bit or maybe skip family prayer sessions, while others go all out and leave the community and choose to go live in the big city for a while. And while some do choose to stay in the modern world, most just kind of, you know, get it out of their system and then return to what they know. But the fact that they're given an opportunity to experience that is actually, it's, it's pretty cool, I think. And there's a lot more religious coming of age rituals. Pretty much every religion has one and there's lots of different variations on each one of them, but they all serve the same purposes, the secular ones really, just to kind of show that they've earned their place in the community as an adult, just a religious community in this case. But part of being an adult is being able to make more babies, which brings us to the fertility rituals. And this is where things start to get a little bit more dicey. So it might feel a little bit strange to celebrate a young teen girl's ability to get pregnant, but uh, if we look at it within the context of ensuring the survival of a tribe, it kind of makes sense. Obviously, I'm not saying that it makes a lot of sense for teen girls to get pregnant, but within a small tribal community, right, their, their survival depends on their capacity to reproduce. So the day that a new member reaches childbearing age, that's, that's considered a blessing. So for some cultures, a girl's first period is a reason to paint the town red. Uh, that joke was written by my writer, Rachel. You can blame her. In Sri Lanka, there's a Buddhist ritual where a girl is secluded in a room during the course of her period, and then she eats a strict diet of bland rice and vegetables because that apparently keeps evil spirits away, and they're especially vulnerable during that period. And contact with men is especially forbidden, because boys are dirty. Toward the end of her seclusion, she's bathed with water containing jasmine flowers and then receives new clothes and ancestral jewelry. The ritual ends when she exits out the back of the house and then enters through the front door officially as a woman. And then at this point, a male relative will, will bash open a coconut and read omens about her future based on how the coconut splits. Mm. 
And then there's a big party with relatives and neighbors and lots of gifts. They did something similar in Incan culture, but instead of eating bland veggies and rice, the girls ate... nothing. That sounds even worse. But on the third day, she was given some corn and her mother bathed her, braided her hair, gave her new clean clothes, and then relatives would visit and give her gifts and she would serve them refreshments. And the ceremony concluded when she was given a new permanent name from her uncle. So what I'm seeing here is that when a girl gets her period, she gets some space, some gifts, a nice bath. I think I know some women that would like this every month. On the much more extreme side of things is the Matata teeth filing ceremony. That's right, they file their teeth down, just in case the menstrual cramps weren't uncomfortable enough. This is a Balinese Hindu ceremony and yeah, the girl's six top front teeth are, are filed flat to discourage certain ugly human traits like greed, rage, lust, and so on. The filing is done by a special priest while the girl lays on top of a high bamboo platform decorated with colorful draperies and the girls wear yellow and white to symbolize holiness. And one more fertility ritual is the Apache sunrise ceremony which takes place in the summer of a girl's first period. She wears a white buckskin dress and becomes a figure known as the changing woman, uh, not symbolizes, becomes, according to their beliefs. Uh, there's music, chanting, prayers, blessings, and ceremonial dancing that goes on for four days. The young girls are exhausted by the end of it, but that's kind of the point. It's a show of endurance and strength. Which leads us into our next category, feats of skill or strength. And these can get pretty extreme. Young men in especially small rural tribes need to be able to show that they can, you know, handle themselves on hunts or in warfare to provide for and defend the tribes and they go to great lengths to prove it. On the North Baffin Islands in Canada, young Inuit boys around 11 or 12 years of age will go on hunting excursions with their fathers. The climate in this area is too harsh for farming, so yeah, all of their sustenance comes from hunting, so it's serious training. In fact, the word for man in their language is the same word for hunter, so you literally, once you can hunt, you become a man. In Western Mongolia, the Kazakh people uh, similarly rely on hunting for all their food, but they have a secret weapon in their hunts, eagles. Yeah, over the generations and centuries, they've passed on the knowledge of training eagles to help with their hunts. Yeah, and much the way dogs have been used in other parts of the world. This is known as a burkuchi. And yeah, passing on the, you know, power of the beast master to their young men is an important part of their culture. So yeah, when a boy comes of age, he spends years training and bonding with his hunting eagle. Let, let's face it, that's, that's easily the coolest one on here. Now you've probably heard of the Aboriginal walkabout ritual, which is a prime example of a young man proving their skill or strength for the benefit of the tribe. In a walkabout, a young male must journey to live in the wilderness for as long as six months before he can come back and join his community as an adult. Life in the Australian outback is not easy. It's incredibly dry, it's scorching hot, and as you know, every single animal in Australia can kill you. So it's incredibly important that young men can show that they can find water and hunt wildlife, fish, create shelter. There's also an element of self-reflection to the walkabout, giving the young person time to reflect on themselves, to focus on what's important to them and figure out who they are. Just as hunting skills may be valued among young men, domestic skills are passed down to young women. Among the Krobo of Eastern Ghana, there's a rite known as Depo that's practiced by young girls from April to May. Several girls go into this together. Uh, some articles say it lasts four days, some say a few weeks. They wear special garb, undergo isolation, train in domestic skills, shave their heads, receive ritualistic baths, and learn the dances special to their people. Kind of like a hardcore boot camp for women. So strength, endurance, and a high level of skill are valued in some cultures. For others, it's just important that you can show that you can withstand a large amount of pain. We've officially entered yikes territory. In the Amazonian jungle, the Matisse tribe prepares their young ones for the hunt by adding elements of pain to their hunting rituals. So if you were a young man about to go on a hunt, they drip bitter, painful juices from a root into your eyes to make them burn and inject poison from a frog into your skin. You're then whipped with rattan stems and then more poison from a leaf is rubbed into your wounds to induce rashes. Now, I don't know, to me, that seems like things that would actually prevent you from being an effective hunter, but they believe that by being forged with pain, it, it heightens your senses and protects you against your own laziness to better your eyesight and help grow your strength. I've never lived or hunted in the Amazon, so what do I know? In Ethiopia, young men prove that they're ready to enter adulthood by running or jumping across a row of cattle without falling four times. Just to make it extra fun, the bulls are first smeared in dung so they'll be more slippery. And if the boys do slip, they have to wait a whole other year to try again. That's not actually the yikes part of the ceremony, though. The yikes part is that the women in the tribe are decorated in bells and dance when the men perform the bull test, and then once a man passes the bull test, um, the women demand that the men whip them to show their own endurance and loyalty. The idea is that after the men whip the women, there's a like a bond created, like a debt of protection felt toward them, and then the women gain attractiveness as a future wife. Now again, this is this is kind of like being beaten into a gang. 
At the end of the ceremony, the men who successfully jumped the bulls shave their heads, and the tribe celebrates together with a party for several days. Oh yeah, what happened to that guy at the beginning? Ah, he was fine. This finally brings us back to the ritual known as the Vanuatu land diving. So Vanuatu is an island in the Pacific, somewhere near Australia and Papua New Guinea. And yeah, these guys jump off a 10-story bamboo tower with nothing but a vine wrapped around their feet. We say guys because only Vanuatu men take part. Uh, and they can participate after they become circumcised around the age of seven or eight. Now this technically isn't a coming of age ritual in the sense that it's not really about becoming adults. It's meant to ensure a bountiful harvest, so they do it every year. But uh, doing it is a major cultural rite of passage for them. Um, it's how you prove that you're a man. It's a show of bravery and self-sacrifice for the tribe. So yeah, it's only a guy thing, but um, ironically, in the legend that this tradition came from, it was a woman who did the jump. As the story goes, a woman was running away from an abusive husband. He was chasing after her, and she found herself at the edge of a cliff. So she tied a vine around her feet and jumped, and then he jumped in after her. She was saved by the vine. He plunged to his death. So they performed this ritual in her honor to appease the gods. The whole thing starts with the men getting a ritual bath and anointed with oils and decorations. Um, there's usually about 10 or 20 men who participate every year, and uh, the women and the men who aren't diving do a ceremonial dance at the bottom. Less experienced divers jump from lower down, more experienced divers go up higher, and apparently the higher the jump, the more bountiful the harvest it brings. When they jump, they tuck their arms in to protect their arms, and then jump as high as they can, falling head first toward the ground. And now I know some of you are sitting there saying, yeah, this is bungee jumping. You're describing bungee jumping. We all know this. Well, no, you don't, because this ain't bungee jumping. These are vines. They are not elastic. They don't gently slow you to a stop. They whip you backwards in a split second from 45 miles an hour and probably separate every single joint in your body from your skull to your toe, if it was my body anyway. The goal of this jump, by the way, is for them to touch their shoulders to the ground when they hit the bottom. So you know, they're, not, they're not stopping way up here in the air. No, they, they hit the ground. That's the point. For some perspective, an Olympic diver will jump from 10 meters or 33 feet. These young men are jumping from 20 to 23 meters. It's just insane. So no, this is not bungee jumping, but it is what inspired bungee jumping. Um, in fact, their attorney general campaigned for bungee jumping companies to pay royalties to them since, you know, it's kind of our thing. <laughs> But people come from all around the world now to see the land divers, and uh, it's a huge tourism draw. Though it is a little controversial, because it is dangerous, and uh, I don't know, it's kind of like commercially exploiting people's deeply held beliefs, that whole thing. Now, if we're going to hang out in the Yikes territory tier, um, we can't not talk about the rituals in Sparta. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's what the Athenians called Sparta back in the day, just Yikes territory. This is Yikes territory. <laughs> In ancient Sparta, at the age of seven, young boys were taken and essentially put into military school called the Agoge until they were 30. Perhaps you've heard Spartans were a, a, a teeny tiny bit militaristic. So boys enter military training at age seven, and at around age 12, the boy was assigned an older mentor who uh, continued his training one-on-one, -on -one, kind of Jedi Knight style. They would learn combat and survival training and serve as the mentor's apprentice, but also his lover. Apparently this was to encourage closeness between the men as they became brothers in arms. I mean, I guess that's one way to do it. Later when they became of a certain age during their training, usually around age 20, they might get put in the Cryptea, which is a more elite, deadly class of soldier, which came with its own rituals. Some sources say that they would have to prove themselves by living out the land in the wilderness for a year. Others claim that in order to be considered a man, they had to first hunt and kill a member of the servant class. Now, if pederasty isn't hardcore enough, we now venture into a group of rituals that involve pain, mutilation, and more pain. A tier that I call, Dear God, Why? Why? A pretty famous coming-of-age ceremony that you may have heard of is the Satara Maui's bullet ant ritual known as Wamat. In case you're not familiar with the bullet ant, it's also known as the Tucandiera ant. Uh, it's a huge ant that lives in the Brazilian Amazon with a sting that's 30 times more poisonous than a bee sting. It's considered one of the most painful stings in the insect kingdom. That's how it got its name, actually. It feels like you've been shot. So, for the Wamut ritual, they collect hundreds of these ants and place them in woven bamboo gloves. The boys then take turns wearing the gloves and enduring the stings of the ants while walking together and chanting. Now, often when the modern world tends to encroach on indigenous tribes, rituals like this tend to start to fade away, but the opposite is actually kind of happening for the bullet ant ritual. It's become kind of a way for them to fend off 
the loggers and invaders. It's an important tradition that maintains cohesion in the tribe. In fact, because there's no shortage of crazy people in the world, it's become a bit of a tourist attraction for men looking to prove something to themselves. They go down there and try out the bullet ant ritual for themselves. It's, uh, uh, might I suggest therapy? Another case of tribal rituals being used to fend off the modern world is a scarification ritual in Papua New Guinea. In some river tribes along the Sepik River, the crocodile is considered a sacred animal. So when boys reach a certain age, they endure a scarification ritual where they receive hundreds of scars along their backs to make them kind of look like a crocodile. It takes about an hour or two and some boys actually pass out from the pain, but another part of the ritual is that it's, it's about purging the mother's blood so that they can gain their own adult blood. Uh, this is actually a recurring theme that I've, I've seen in a lot of these more brutal ceremonies. The idea that, you know, since the boy came from a woman, he has to purge the woman's blood in order to truly become a man. But perhaps the most brutal coming of age ceremony imaginable comes from the indigenous Mondan people of North Dakota. And, uh, seriously, this is not for the squeamish. It's known as the Oki Pa ceremony, and it's meant to solidify their connection with nature and the great spirit. It starts with a four-day dance where participants wear costumes that emulate a range of animals like buffalo, bald eagles, and grizzly bears. But the hardcore part of the ceremony is when volunteers, uh, all of them young men who have spent the last few days feasting and praying, they get painted in red, white, or black pigment, and then have wooden skewers inserted through their chest and back muscles as well as in their legs and their arms. The skewers are then attached to ropes that are pulled from the ceiling in a ceremonial lodge, which lifts them off the ground. And there they would hang for hours sometimes with buffalo skulls attached to the skewers in their arms and legs to increase the weight and the pain. Crying was not allowed, but the pain was so extreme that many of these men would pass out from the pain and, and it would put them in a trance-like state during which they would receive messages from the Great Spirit. After the ceremony, they were considered men of fortitude who had proven their loyalty and ability to endure severe pain through self-sacrifice. And from that point forward, they were entitled to warrior status. The ceremony was actually outlawed in the 1890s, but it's kind of been resurrected in recent years by some in the body modification community and pain enthusiasts. Is that the right word? <laughs> now, if you're thinking to yourself, how can rituals possibly get any worse than that? Um, well, let's just dip into an entire subgenre of rituals that involve um, <clears throat> adult unanesthetized circumcision. The Maasai in Kenya have a ritual called the Amuratare, where a group of boys 14 to 16 years old will travel with a handful of elders for four months, and then a week before the ceremony, they must herd cattle for seven consecutive days while carrying a heavy ceremonial spear. The night before the main event, the boys all sleep outside, and then in the morning, they run back into their village as if they were raiders, and dance throughout the day and into the night. Just before dawn the next day, they are cleaned with a cold shower, and then undergo the circumcision without anesthetics. Healing takes three to four months, and afterwards they receive the status as a new warrior. And this is where I'm going to stop. There's actually a lot more uh, rituals that involve circumcision and genital mutilation of both sexes, but I'm already flirting hard with an age restriction on this video, so I'm just going to make a supplemental video on Nebula. So uh, yeah, if you have a healthy, morbid curiosity and want to hear more about all that stuff, just go watch it there. It's not all about um, genital mutilation, by the way. There's, there's other things that are just as horrific. Maybe. Including the one where the young boys stick bamboo reeds down their <laughs> until they purge up <laughs> and it comes out their <laughs> and they reel <laughs> back down into their <laughs> and their <laughs> explode like really <laughs> big and that's when they become a man. So I want to step back uh, one more time and just reiterate that this is not meant to judge these other cultures. I mean, from my pasty European background, yeah, these seem brutal and crazy, but from their perspective, these are important rights that prove that they're tough enough to survive and even thrive in these very harsh environments. I mean, to them, we're lazy, soft weaklings that have been handed our worth without ever earning it. And let's just be honest, they're right. But it is funny to me how universal these ceremonies and rituals are. In fact, I left a lot of them out of this video, but I think it speaks to just how social we are as a species and, and I don't know, just how universal just the experience of going through life is. Um, oh, and one thing, by the way, that's worth bringing up is that, you know, up until very recently, the infant mortality rate was much higher than it is now. So yeah, in the past, making it to adulthood really was a cause for celebration. You know, something else that happens when you become an adult is you get to vote and you get to have a voice in your society. You know, again, with proving that you're of age and a productive part of the community, a productive and informed part of the community. 
And that is where Ground News comes in. Ground News is an app and a website developed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, objective way to read the news. They aggregate news articles from all kinds of different sources from all around the world. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. So on the topic of coming-of-age rituals, Gambia's parliament just voted to rescind the ban on female genital mutilation, which I do talk about in my extra spicy video on Nebula. But we can pull up the story right here, and as you can see, there's 62 articles uh, that you can choose from and they're from all around the world so you've got like NPR and the Washington Post here from the States but there's also Aristogai Noticias, there's Le Monde in France, uh, El Pais, so they're all over the place. And in each one of these articles right up here at the top you can see it's clearly marked who owns the source, the factuality rating of that source, and its political bias. So you know for NPR right here it says it leans left. Uh, so before you click any of these articles you have a solid idea of who this information is coming from and what biases they might have. And for a more visual breakdown, uh, right over here on the right, you can see bias, factuality, and ownership distribution charts. So you can see in the bias distribution, the coverage has been mostly center left. Uh, there's only 11% right wing coverage, 43% uh, center, 46% left. And by the way, this is what they might call a blind spot, meaning it's something that only one side of the political spectrum is covering in their media. And that's actually how I found this is through my blind spot feed. So you can find the blind spot feed on the right side of the home page right here. Just click view blind spot feed and it pulls it up like this. It's pretty simple. It's got for the left on the left, for the right on the right. And for the left column shows articles that are not being reported in the left-leaning news, and the for the right-leaning column uh, it shows articles that aren't being reported in the right-leaning news. So whatever bias you might have, you can bust it with the blind spot feed. So look, I, I get asked all the time, like, what's my biggest concern about the future? And for me, it always seems to come back to the problem of misinformation and media bubbles. You know, like, we just, we live in a world where the people who give us our information, they've got more incentives to get you to click on that information than in getting that information right. It's all about activating your emotions and not your brain. And now in this world of, you know, AI making it possible for anybody to create anything with just a text prompt, having a system like this is, is more than about just being a better informed person. It's not just crucial. I would, I would argue it's almost mandatory at this point. Oh, and here's another thing that always happens whenever I get on ground news is you feel like you actually understand the topic better because you see it from different angles, you know? I really can't recommend Ground News enough. And best of all, Ground News is now currently offering 40% off their Vantage plan, which gives you unlimited access to all their amazing features. So you can go to ground.news slash Joe Scott or click the link below. It's only $5 a month. I promise you, it's well worth the subscription. So once again, that's ground.news slash Joe Scott. The link's down below. Give it a shot. Um, I think you'll like it. And I, I think it's something that we could all really use right now. Big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are forming an awesome community, being super supportive, helping myself out and each other, and uh, helping to keep the lights on around here. I can't thank you guys enough. If this is your first time here, maybe check out this video or go down the rabbit hole of any of the videos that pop up on the side. If you enjoy them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every week. And that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.